We have now a paper by Howard Pollock. No, we do not, alas, have Howard Pollock, uh, uh, arguably the great American uh, biographer of composers. Uh, but we have his paper, which will be uh, read by Mariana. I regret that I cannot attend the centennial celebration of the neglected American composer Jerome Moross. I would like to thank Marianna Whitmer for organizing this panel, for inviting me to participate, and for reading this paper, as well as to panel member Susanna Tarjan Moross for her unstinting support of my research. In January 1939, in perhaps the first known reference to composer Jerome Moross and poet lyricist John Latouche as a team, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle reported that the two were at work on an opera. Latouche was only 24 at the time, Maras a mere one year older. Latouche recently had attained some modest fame for two lyrics composed for the blockbuster union musical Pins and Needles, but he was approaching the creation of two works that would put him on the map in a big way, Ballad for Americans with music by Earl Robinson and popularized by Paul Robeson, and Cabin in the Sky, the all-black musical with composer Vernon Duke that contained the hit song Taking a Chance on Love. As for Maras, by 1939, he already had achieved some notoriety for a few avant-garde orchestral works, and especially for his dance score, Frankie and Johnny. He and Latouche plainly were two rising talents worthy of notice. Notwithstanding the fact that Latouche was gay and Maras straight, and that Latouche hailed from Richmond, Virginia, and Maras the Lower East Side, the two had much in common, over and above their extraordinary preco precociousness. Maras was the child of Jewish immigrants, and Latouche descended on his mother's side from Jewish immigrants as well. Both had strongly nonconformist personality. Latouche barely made it through two years at Columbia University before dropping out. Both were leftist in their politics, and both tended to be emotionally volatile. Although Latouche, a heavy drinker and possibly bipolar, seems to have been by a long shot the wilder of the two. Observers variously referred to him as the American Villon, the American Rainbow, and the American Cocteau, which should give you an idea. <laughs> Moreover, both Maras and Latouche, even without benefit of a European education, had a very knowing understanding of advanced trends in the arts, but shared as well a keen interest in working with popular materials, especially folk ballads, an unusual combination that made their collaboration highly congenial. We remain unsure as to how they first became acquainted. They could have met through musical theater circles or even more likely through Aaron Copeland, a close mutual friend and a mentor to both. Latouche had the sort of interest in contemporary music unusual for a poet, and as early as November 1934, while a sophomore at Columbia, he even made a dismissive reference to, quote, empty sounds of the younger composers, unquote presumably meaning those young New York composers, including Maras, who had gathered around Copeland during this time. In any case, by 1939, Latouche and Maras had become good friends and would remain so until Latouche's untimely death in 1956 at the age of 41. As a collaborator, Latouche was notoriously erratic and unreliable, but he always was in high demand as a lyricist, especially by theater composers who sought a brilliance and sophistication on par with their own. Tellingly, he provided the words for Earl Robinson's most successful work, Ballad for Americans, for Vernon Duke's most successful musical, Cabin in the Sky, for Duke Ellington's most successful musical, The Beggar's Opera, and for Douglas Moore's most successful opera, The Ballad of Baby Doe. Had Latouche not been replaced by Richard Wilbur on Leonard Bernstein's Candide, he plausibly might have helped make that work a more successful dramatic piece as well. But obviously of special relevance here, he wrote, the two, uh, he wrote the opera librettos to two of Maras's most important and successful works, Ballet Ballads of 1948 and The Golden Apple of 1954. Ballet Ballads originated as a short one-act dance theater piece, Susanna and the Elders, composed in the months straddling 1939 and 1940. Based on the biblical story of Susanna told in the Apocrypha, this short oratorio, as Maras and Latouche called it, featured a dancing Susanna and a singing Susanna, a device ostensibly borrowed from Brecht and Viles of the Seven Deadly Sins. The work aimed to capture 
the spirit and style of a revivalist meeting, with the influence of hymnody ev evident in both its music and words. Maras and Latouche might well have derived some inspiration in this respect from painter Thomas Hart Benton's framed 19, famed 1938 backwoods interpretation of the same biblical story. As for its novel incorporation of dance and song, the impetus for this presumably came, aside from Brechtfile, mostly from Maras, who already had experimented with such hybrid forms in Frankie and Johnny and other works. After a successful airing of Susanna and the Elders in 1940, Maras and Latouche considered adapting Ben Jonson's Volpone as an opera. But after the war, they decided rather to supplement Susanna with three more one-act dance dramas for a full evening entertainment, with Susanna to be used as a curtain raiser. In the first, Willie the Weeper, Latouche adapted and expanded two American ballads, Willie the Weeper and Cocaine Lil, to create a story about a poor chimney sweeper, Willie, and his marijuana-induced fears and fantasies. The second, The Eccentricities of Davy Crockett, drew on several legends surrounding the eponymous frontier hero. The third, Riding Hood Revisited, comprised a fractured version of the Charles Perrault fairy tale by having the story's wolf portrayed as an old world roué who attempts to flee from Red Riding Hood's insatiable sexual demands. Maras complimented the hymnal style of Susanna and the Elders by referencing blues and boogie woogie in Willie the Weeper, cowboy music in the eccentricities of Davy Crockett, and cartoon music in Riding Hood Revisited, making the ballet ballads a very rounded work of Americana, with each act combining word, music, and dance, as well as solo and choral singing in distinctive and unusual ways. However, as presented on Broadway by ANTA, the American National Theater and Academy in 1948, ballet ballads presented Susanna and the Elders, Willie the Weeper, and the eccentricities of Davy Crockett as a three-act work without Riding Hood revisited, some of which Maras subsequently adapted as variations on a waltz tune, one of his most delightful orchestral works. Maras originally scored ballet ballads for two pianos, but in later years arranged them for orchestra as well. Following ballet ballads, which enjoyed more critical than popular <coughs> success, Latouche and Maras collaborated on an adaptation of the Iliad and the Odyssey, The Golden Apple, which opened off-Broadway in early 1954 before moving to a Broadway house for a run of a few months. The Golden Apple employs Homeric myth to explore the dislocations of provincial America in the early 20th century caused by the industrialized metropole, but does so in an extremely whimsical and charming manner. With its witty and colloquial but entirely rhymed libretto and its accessible and tuneful but through composed score, the work represents an impressive achievement, both in terms of technique and content. And indeed, the Golden Apple won the New York Drama Critics Circles Award for Best Musical of the 1953-54 season. But the work had, as mentioned, only a short run on Broadway and has rarely been revived since, although its best known number, Lazy Afternoon, in which contrary to the received tale, Helen seduces Paris, remains in the cabaret repertoire, and the work as a whole has assumed a cult status as one of the most undervalued works in the history of American musical theater. The designation by the New York Drama Critics Circle of the work as the season's best musical, by the way, should not mislead us into thinking of the work as anything other than an opera in the popular sense of the term, even though commentators and historians, as in the case of Porgy and Bess, often refer to it as a musical. Indeed, as if to prove the point, the Critics Circle gave its Best Musical Award the following year to Giancarlo Minotti's The Saint of Bleecker Street. But as with ballet ballads, the amalgam of popular and serious elements found in The Golden Apple forms part of its essential makeup and helps explain why both works have had trouble finding a <coughs> in so stratified a musical theater culture as our own. Indeed, although RCA Victor issued an original cast album of excerpts from The Golden Apple, and Noxos released a recording of the orchestrated Willie the Weeper, to date neither Ballet Ballads nor The Golden Apple has been commercially recorded in its entirety. In the brief time remaining, I would like to present an excerpt from Willie the Weeper. The piece opens with a moody blues theme that provides the basis for this highly organic one actor, which takes the shape of a theme in variations. Like Alban Berg, Maras favored shaping dramatic scenes into classical musical forms. As the curtain rises, the stage is in darkness, illuminated only by Willie lighting up a joint and singing. And I refer you to your handout. <coughs> 
did you ever hear about Willie the Weeper? Listen to the story of Willie the Weeper, made his living as a chimney sweeper. But he'd leafer, smoke a reefer, it made him feel glad. Listen while I tell you of a dream. <coughs> For this paper, I will quote from the libretto, as used in the recording, we will hear shortly, which differs in some details, placed here in brackets from the text as found in the published score. Latouche's command that the audience listen to the story establishes contact not only with folk balladry and Brechtian stagecraft, but with the preceding act, Susanna and the Elders, which similarly begins with the chorus demanding, hear the story. As the lights slowly rise and the dancers are seen, the text continues. And I hesitate to read all of this, since you have it in your handout. Um, here, Latouche uses classic AAB blues form as the narration starts in earnest, another distancing effect related both to folk traditions and to Brecht. Continuing on, folks would sit up when he lit up his magical weed, and so on. At this point, the chorus enters, repeating he wasn't much of a man, thus serving as an observing chorus, distancing the story still more, and they continue to echo the narrator as he continues, the big time had stung him and we left him lay so on until we'll get for everyone the kind of fun they need. At this point, the chorus asks, who's Willie? In a striking coup de théâtre, the narrator answers, I'm Willie, I'm the richest guy in town, as his dancing double emerges from behind him. It's a ringside table and a Mabel wrapped in sable when rich Willie comes around, says Willie, as he dresses dancing Willie in elegant clothes, setting the stage for the first fantasy variation, Rich Willie. Rich Willie will be followed in turn by Lonely Willie, Famous Willie, and so on. One can observe on Latouche's part, even in this introduction, an imagination, wit, hipness, and technical mastery as, com as commanding as that of any of the time's finest lyricists, including Lawrence Hart and Cole Porter, but used in the service of a large dramatic form and a serious theme. An achievement comparable among Americans to Mark Blitzstein in his capacity as a librettist, but few others. Maras, meanwhile, provides an emotional depth of his own far beyond what's capable in typical popular song form as he expands the blues theme into denser chromatic terrain in order to build a powerful momentum that finally explodes into the first episode in which motoric rhythms underline fantasies of power and greed. I would like to play a recording of this excerpt not from the one com commercially available recorded version of Willie the Weaver, but rather from an archival recording from a 1950 Los Angeles performance that uses the original two piano version, and that although far inferior in sound, seems to me musically superior, thanks in large part to Jerry Duane's extraordinary performance as Willie. Of course, a recording of so theatrically conceived a work can provide only a limited sense of the piece, and for that reason I have included as well stage directions in your handout as well as the text. In the interest of time, we will begin not with the instrumental prologue, but at that moment at which the curtain rises. I apologize in advance for the poor sound quality. with lyrics by Edward Eager, and Sorry, Wrong Number, 1977, with a text by Louise Fletcher, adapted by the composer, as well as the unproduced Underworld, with lyrics by John Hollander and Lester Hus Hus Judson. But a consideration of these works, which also warrant study, will have to wait for another time. <laughs> 